Okay, we're going to turn to the scripture, Psalm 37, in our series, Heart of Worship. This message is about all of life worship. And of course, we focus on the time when we sing the songs and we praise Him. And this is a song. Uh, it, 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 there is praise in all this. But there's also stuff for us to learn about in all of our lives. So let's, without further ado, get to the scriptures. Do not fret. Psalm 37, 1, do not fret because of those who are evil or be anxious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither like green, part, green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. This is a key verse. Take delight in the, in the Lord or delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. And we're going to focus on that word desire a lot in this message. Take delight in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed. But those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. And all God's people said, Amen. So we have a psalm of David. If you notice, the title is of David. In fact, no uh, long descriptions of who he is there. No superhero capes that he's wearing. There's no mention at this stage, David, giant killer or writer of half the psalms. David the king. David the visionary dreamer and financier of the temple. Um, there's no reference to David has slain his tens of thousands, just David. And you know, I found it helpful in the time that uh, I was off work. Um, actually, for the first time in a long time, it certainly slowed me down. And it reminded me of the old truth of our indispensability. Uh, God's going to fulfill his plans no matter what. And by the way, I'll say it again, I'm very thankful to know that we've got a wonderful team uh, that have been doing all that work. But last week was just Reese. Of David, well, it was just, just Reese. No titles, no capes, just me and Jesus, a good wife, and of course a daughter who's about to leave home as well. But uh, think about the psalm, it's just you. Just David, just you, just me. And so I'm calling this an all-of-life song. This is really who David is. David's a worshiper. That's why he doesn't need the titles. David is a man after God's own heart. And David is someone who just loves the Lord above all. Now we do know kind of what season of life he was in, even though the title only says of David. In verse 25 he says, I was young and now I'm old. Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. I was young and now I'm old. That tells us, of course, he's older now. Uh, this of David is the David who's been able to reflect to go through the ups and downs, the wins and the losses, the successes and the failures. He's been there, he's seen it, he's done it. And the conclusion is that even when things don't seem to be right, God will put things right and we can still trust him. And so it's good to know this is a mature psalm as David looks back. So this worship song is David's life. It's clearly a psalm of trust. Verse 3, trust in the Lord. Uh, it reminds us of the, the Proverbs as well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And so right from the start, I want to encourage you, let all of your life be for the Lord. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, that's how you know the Lord. That's how you know God through Jesus Christ, who, who is God. He is the Son of God. We can't reach up to God, but God has reached down to us in Christ. And I encourage you, believe in Jesus Christ. Put your trust in him and then fashion your life after him and according to his word. Let every part of your life be for the Lord. Trust God in every part, in every room of your house, in, in, in every app that you open, every relationship, every day. Be like David. Be a man after God's own heart. And what I love about David in this life song of his is that there's nothing half-hearted. There's nothing apathetic. He fought the Lord's battles, and when he danced before the Lord, he danced with all his might. This is his life song. This is all of life worship. Now, we can also say this about the psalm generally. This is also an instructive psalm. There's lots of uh, direction in this. Phrases like, don't fret, don't worry, commit, 
dwell, trust, delight. There's clear instruction from this wise man who is a singer of the Lord's songs. He wants us to know that the core of all his being and the core of all our worship is to make sure that we're always trusting God. There's one other, one other thing as well we may not know if we don't read Hebrew, and that is that uh, this is an alphabetic psalm. And so there's a tremendous logic to the psalm that walks us through how all of our life can be surrendered to him. And so that's where I would say this psalm is very much like the Proverbs. God's word is full of mystery, and the psalms have that element of mystery, uh, of, uh, of, of a devotion to God. But it's also the greatest logic of all as well. The word of God is logical as well as mysterious. And this psalm has got a lot of logic to us as well. Now I'm going to summarize the psalm. And we just read the nine verses of this long psalm. I'm going to summarize it with that word desire. In fact, I think it's fair to see this season through that word. And it's fair to see this scripture through that word as well. John Piper famously a few years ago wrote a book called Desiring God. And he made the point that he's a Christian hedonist, which means a Christian pleasure seeker. And when I was reading it many years ago, I was like, well, that's an interesting phrase. Uh, But he says, yes, I'm a joy seeker. You're allowed to be a joy seeker. But then, of course, he says, there's only one place you can find joy, and it's with the Lord. And therefore, the Christian has strong desire. We're not against desire. We're for desire. But the Christian has desire for God. We delight in him. And therefore, the desires of our hearts are fulfilled in our own hearts. And here's the first thing I want to say about this psalm. Our desires determine our direction. Isn't that true in life? You know, where there's a will, there's a way. If we really want to make that thing work, we will. If we don't, it tends not to happen. Our desires determine our direction. Verse 4, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Where our desire is... Jesus said, where our treasure is, and as you can see a lot of the echoes of Christ's teaching in this psalm, where our desire is, well, that affects everything. If I delight in God, if God is my pursuit, then I will get joy because the only source of joy is the Lord. And so if I want to be happy, if I want to have those desires fulfilled, then I delight myself in the Lord. I desire God. And so it, it's always a good thing to lean into the big picture, isn't it? Always good to lean into the, into the, big, um, into the big things. Um, I, I heard a while back that there's a school of time management that's moved away from the idea that you kind of manage every 10 or 15 minutes, you have it all scheduled out and written down. And there are days like that, every one of us, we've got kind of a tight schedule some days. But I've heard it increasing to say, what we often need to do is to lean into Big chunks of time being focused on the things that are most critical and most important in our life. And I tend to lean into that. Like, as a pastor, I have to spend big chunks of time studying and make sure I don't get that filled in with all the little minutiae and things that take your attention away, but focus on the things that you need to do. And with your family, make sure that's, you know, focused time, big chunks of time, spending time uh, on the things that matter. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom. It's a bit like delight yourself in the Lord, isn't it? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be given unto you. We either seek all those other things, we get consumed with that, that will determine the outcome of our life. But if we seek Christ, if we seek the Lord, if we delight ourselves in God, if we become worshippers, and the most important satisfaction in our life, if it's founded in God, then that really determines the outcome of our life as well. So in this passage, there are 16 references to the wicked. In Psalm 37, 16 references, and there are 10 references to the righteous. And the point of mentioning that is that there's a contrast between the righteous and the unrighteous. The desire of the wicked leads them down a certain path, and there's ultimately no satisfaction, though they may seem to succeed for a while. And that's one of the underlying philosophical questions. How come sinful people seem to get away with it and have good lives for a while? Well, we've not seen the final outcome yet. The righteous clearly do have hard times, and the righteous sometimes wonder, well, how come they're doing well? How come I'm not doing well? But if you focus on the Lord over the long haul, you will be truly satisfied. And so it's a very kind of proverbial, a sort of Proverbs-type psalm, that contrast between the wicked and the righteous. The, the ultimate desire of each one of us uh, determines the outcome of our life. Jesus talked about a broad way that leads to destruction. But a few will turn off the narrow path that leads to, to life. I'm encouraging you, my friend, today. Trust in the Lord. 
Delight yourself in the Lord. Don't fret. Don't do evil. Don't be envious of those who do wrong. But turn off that narrow road and trust in the Lord. It's obvious in these days that the many in the culture are trying to say, follow this way. Um, how dare you believe uh, in objective truth? How dare you believe that Jesus is only the way? How dare you believe that God made us male and female? And so the world is trying to take us off that path. There's a lot of propaganda about that in our day. But the Christian is not against desires. The Christian seeks right desire. The Christian is not just gloriously neutral. The Christian is passionate in our pursuit of the narrow way that leads to life, believing that there is true joy in the Lord. By the way, the actual division in our nation today is not really left and right. But according to the scripture, it's wise and foolish. It's righteous and unrighteous. It's saved or lost. It's forgiven or unforgiven. It's spiritually alive, made alive in Christ, or it's dead in our trespasses and sins. It all comes down to our deepest desire. Do we seek God? Your desire, my desire, will determine the outcome of our life. So don't worry if the wicked seem to be temporarily succeeding for a while. Don't fret, refrain from anger. Don't get angry. Well, how do these people do this? And you don't know about this. A lot of people leave that alone. Verse 1, do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Don't be envious of those who do wrong. I've sometimes heard people say, you know, if I wasn't a Christian, then I would do this. It's like, hey, don't fantasize about not being a Christian. There's, there's no progress in not being a Christian. You need Christ. Let Jesus be in your life. So never say, if I was a Christian, I would. Do the opposite. If I was a Christian, this is what I would do. And I pray that we will truly be Christian and have Christ in the center of our life. Let Christ be the true treasure of our heart. And so those desires will determine our outcome. If we trust in the Lord and we do good, we will dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. In other words... Uh, if our desire is for the Lord, uh, there will be good outcomes that follow. We will thrive where we are, even when it's tough. We'll thrive when we are, even when the world seems to be apparently thriving even more than we do. They're not really. And so that is the outcome, verse 6. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication, like the noonday sun. By the way, this does not necessarily mean material blessing. The very worst thing that you, could happen to you and I is that we had such riches that we would uh, not trust God. In, in actual fact, uh, I've stumbled across a few who have great riches, and I would say I haven't seen any more happiness in their life. They still have every bit as many problems and troubles along the way. I would say that the greatest riches that we have are spiritual satisfaction in the Lord. He may well provide for you. Uh, with material blessings. And to that, say glory, hallelujah, and make sure that we steward it well. Uh, but that's not what our life is about. Life is more than what we eat or what we drink. Uh, life is about trusting God. Secondly, I want to say our desires are not perfect. And so just as our desires determine our direction and we want to desire the Lord and know Christ, it's Christ in us. So it's also wise for us to know that before we were saved, our de desires are only not perfect, but we were simply incapable of pleasing God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Apart from you, you could do nothing, Jesus said. Um, our desires are not perfect. We're, we're sinners, and that's why we put an asterisk on that emoji that, that uh, God made you with a heart, but our heart gets corrupted. The Bible tells us our, our heart is deceitful in so many ways. And so we see that in the passage, that there are those who fret over those who are doing evil and envious of those who are doing wrong. We can sometimes find ourselves in great fretfulness. The believer's position is that we trust God, we follow Jesus, we put Jesus first, and he does a work in our hearts. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of, of your heart. There's a transformation that takes place in our sinful hearts through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful for what God has worked in my heart and I need that work to be ongoing. That's called sanctification. When the process by which we're made more holy. We're being transformed increasingly into his likeness. And so there was a trend a while back just to say, follow your heart. There's a pastor, a tremendous youth evangelist in our land called Shane Pruitt. And he often 
really emphasizes if you have a follow your heart theology, you'll run into trouble because the heart is deceitful. We, we need a theology that's about the transformation of our hearts. And we need to make sure that we follow Jesus not our hearts. Our hearts need to follow Jesus. We don't follow our hearts, we follow Jesus. And that changes our hearts. I know that might be a hard thing for us to hear because it almost seems to go against the flow of the culture that says, follow your heart. But following your heart can lead you into great great difficulty. We need that transformation to take place. Now, the key background story is that men succeed in their schemes even when their hearts are wrong. You think about the people in David's life. Saul, His heart was very corrupted. The Philistines, they were idolaters. Nabal, his own wife said he was a fool. Yeah, that actually is in the Bible. Absalom, he got embittered. And so his heart was corrupted. And so his leadership got tainted and caused a great deal of havoc. Shimei was a man who was very angry. He was angry, angry, angry and got angry uh, uh, and and took it out on David for a season. Uh, People do wrong, and we ask ourselves, well, why do they do so well? That's the background of the psalm. But the psalm, in in essence, is saying to us, don't worry. They're going to get their comeuppance. You don't have to sort them out. you just got to make sure that your heart is being worked on. Verse 2, for soon they shall be cut down like the grass. C.H. Spurgeon said, the destruction of the ungodly will be speedy, sudden, sure, overwhelming, irretrievable. The grass cannot resist or escape the mower. King Belshazzar was mocking the Lord at a party. uh, And that very night as he was celebrating and mocking the things of God, the kingdom was stripped from him and there was a regime change and he died. Haman tried to kill Mordecai on the gallows. In one day, it all swiftly turned around. The grass withered in Haman's life and instead of being the man in power, who could create the, uh, use those anti-Semitic uh, attacks upon, upon the, the people of God, soon that was turned around on him. The second Herod was eaten by worms. David saw this outworked in his life, that our hearts are not perfect. There's a lot of sinfulness in this world. We don't have to get mad about the sinfulness of others. We, don't have to, we refrain from anger. We don't fret about that. But we do need to make sure that we are delighting in the Lord that the desires of our heart outwork as we focus on the Lord. You can follow your heart when your sins have been forgiven, washed away, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're delighting in God. That's when, in a sense, we're following our heart. But even then, actually, aren't we not following the Lord uh, above all? Uh, And so that's the background question. One commentary says, what do we do when divine governance seems to fail? First, we maintain an ethical responsibility This is the counsel of patience, bearing under the strain of what looks like divine in action. And yet, verse 7, we are still before the Lord, and we wait wait patiently for him. Verse 4, when we dwell in the land, literally this means stay in the place where God has put you and fulfill your duty there. What do we do with all the mixture of emotions in in our nation right now? Focus on the Lord's work. Focus on the job in hand. We got D now. We got Sunday by Sunday, Wednesday by Wednesday, March Madness at church, Easter, your group, our worship. Focus on the things that are very important. Nurture your children in the love of the Lord. Be a good worker in the place of work that God has blessed you with. Steward your finance as well. Be generous. Be a person of prayer and, yes, a person of adoration of the Lord. And this phrase, commit to the Lord, as we get our hearts right, so we commit to him. Literally, it means dislodge the burden from your shoulders and lay it on God who has bidden you to follow this course. And so with regard to anger, verse 9, refrain. Refrain, refrain. I see the speck in their eye. Refrain, refrain. Take the plank out of our own eye. And so, uh, thirdly, we need the Lord to be the king of our desires. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And there's motivation to seek the Lord just by looking what it's like if we don't seek the Lord. Verse 10, in a a little while the wicked will be no more. They seem to be prospering at the moment, but they will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But how about if we do follow the Lord? How about if we do delight in him? How about if Jesus is the treasure of our heart? How about if we do say, let the king of my heart be the ransom for my life. 
Verse 24, though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I was young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the children begging bread. So once again, don't be offended at the idea of the warning with regard to our hearts, because our hearts can be fickle. Be encouraged that a transformation can take place as we trust him, as we commit, as the Lord does his work in us through saving us, through sanctifying us, through preparing us for heaven. Be encouraged because that becomes the sweetest thing. Worship becomes the sweetest thing. We unmute in our praises to God. We unmute in sharing what God has done because the Lord becomes the king of our desires. Oh yeah, there'll be people that will still mock us. Jesus said, don't be surprised if the world uh, hates you. But again, I want to quote Spurgeon who wrote that magnificent treasury of David. On Psalm 37, he says, within believers... There is a living and incorruptible seed that liveth and abideth forever. Why should they envy mere flesh and its glory, which are as grass and flower thereof? And so let Christ reign in my heart today. Let him rule in your heart. When he reigns in my heart, when I desire him, when I follow his word, when I'm obedient... It's a totally different way to the wicked. Uh, And I don't want to be tempted to say, I wish I could be like them. But rather, verse 29 says, the righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. So don't fret. Don't be angry. Trust. Commit. Put your trust in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart.